Welcome back to Killer Stories. I'm your host, Bobby Holmes. Today is the day. I'm finally going to wrap up BTK. If you're tuning in today but have not listened to part one or two, things will make a lot more sense if you go back and listen to those first. For those who are up to speed, let's just do a quick recap. Dennis has now killed the Otero family of four, Catherine Bright, Shirley Vianne, and Nancy Fox. Catherine Bright's brother, Kevin, escaped Dennis and was able to give a description to the police. There were also three witnesses in the murder of Shirley Vianne, her children. However, due to their young ages, they weren't able to give much information detectives could actually use. Dennis thrives on the attention these murders are getting. He begins communicating with the media and police via letters and anonymous phone calls. A letter stated, quote, The code words for me would be bind them, torture them, kill them, unquote, dubbing himself BTK. He sent more than just letters. Last week, I recited three poems for you. Poems depicting the deaths of Shirley Vianne and Nancy Fox. Another about the fact that his attempted eighth target, Anna Williams, did not appear the night he waited up for her. The city of Wichita is in full panic mode. They have an active serial killer living among them. Many people install security systems to prevent break-ins. But Dennis, ADT installation supervisor, was actually the one walking around in their homes, learning the layout and determining if they would become his next project. One of the letters written to police confessed to killing Shirley Vianne, Nancy Fox, and another unnamed woman. My guess is that he wanted the attention, but he doesn't want to name Catherine because it wasn't his M.O. He panicked and ended up stabbing her. It didn't fit BTK signature moves. I'm going to read the entirety of this particular letter. Quote, I find the newspaper not writing about the poem on vain, unamusing. A little paragraph would have enough. I know it not the media fault. The police chief, he keep things quiet and doesn't let public know they're a psycho running around, lose strangling mostly women. There are seven in the ground. Who will be next? How many do I have to kill before I get a name in the paper or some national attention? Do the cop think that all those deaths are not related? Golly gee, yes, the M.O. is different in each, but look at the pattern is developing. The victims are tie up, most have been women, phone cut, bring some bondage, matter sadist tendencies, no struggle, outside the death spot, no witnesses except the Vane's kids. They were very lucky. A phone call saved them. I was going to tape the boys and put plastic bags over their head like I did Joseph and Shirley, and then hang the girl. God, oh God, what a beautiful sexual relief that would have been. Josephine, when I hung her, really turned me on. Her pleading for mercy, then the rope took hold. She helpless, staring at me with wide, terror-filled eyes, the rope getting tighter, tighter. You don't understand these things because you're not under the influence of Factor X. The same thing that made Son of Sam, Jack the Ripper, Harvey Glattman, Boston Strangler, Dr. H. H. Holmes, Pantyhose Strangler of Florida, Hillside Strangler, Ted of the West Coast, which he's referring to Ted Bundy, and many more infamous character kill, which seems senseless, but we cannot help it. There is no help, no cure, except death or being caught and put away. It is a terrible nightmare, but you see, I don't lose any sleep over it. After a thing like Fox, I come home and go about life like anyone else. And I would be like that until the urge hit me again. It not continuous, and I don't have a lot of time. It take time to set a kill. One mistake and it all over. Since I about blew it on the phone, handwriting is out, letter guide is too long, and typewriter can be traced too. My short poem of death and maybe a drawing. Later on, real picture and maybe a tape of the sound will come your way. How will you know me? Before a murder or murders, you will receive a copy of the initials BTK. You keep that copy. The original will show up someday on Guess Who? May you not be the unluck one. 
PS2. How about some name for me? It's time. Seven down and many more to go. I like the following. How about you? The BTK Strangler. Wichita Strangler. Poetic Strangler. The Bond Age Strangler. Or Psycho. The Wichita Hangman. The Wichita Executioner. The Garot Phantom. The Asphyxiator. BTK. Unquote. Once again, filled with spelling mistakes and grammatical errors, keep in mind these letters have been received, but the details are not fully released to the public. He thinks perhaps a new name will spark an article to be written. Although the poetic strangler has a nice ring to it, police and media end up sticking with BTK. The murder of Nancy Fox happened in 1977. After his letters and poems to the Wichita Eagle, Dennis kept quiet and didn't kill anyone else until April of 1985. This seems very strange that he has these deep desires and urges, but he's able to suppress them for eight years, just living life as a loving husband and father of two, a normal guy. But just like that, a switch flipped. He says he never stopped trolling for victims. Maybe it just took him eight years to find the right one. The funny thing is, she was right in front of him the whole time. A 53-year-old widow named Maureen Hedge lived on their block. I don't think they actually knew each other that well, but they would smile and wave, exchange greetings when they did see each other. Dennis began planning an attack on Maureen. He called it Project Cookie. He already knew the layout of her home and that she lived alone. It would be all too easy just to sneak down the street. But this is Dennis we're talking about. Of course he is going to complicate matters. The night he chooses to break in is the night he was chaperoning a Boy Scout trip with his son, Brian. He told everyone that he had a terrible headache and was going to run into town and get some medicine, then call it a night and head to bed. But what he actually did was drive to a bowling alley. He ordered a beer But instead of drinking it, he just swished it around in his mouth, splashed it on his face and shirt. He was trying to make himself smell as if he was intoxicated. Then he called a cab and asked for a ride to Park City, which is where he and Maureen Hedge lived. I don't understand this elaborate prelude to the break-in. If he's trying to establish an alibi, most everyone already thinks he's on the Boy Scout trip. I guess I can see why he wouldn't want to park his car near the house, especially if his wife Paula was home. He had the cab drop him off at a park close by. He told the cabbie he was going to walk off his buzz. Once he walked around the block to Maureen's house, he could see her car parked in the driveway. He crept over and cut her phone line. After quietly breaking into the home through the back door, he realized she was not home so he decided to wait for her. But he didn't have to wait long. Soon, another car pulled up to the house. Are you ready to start a new bedtime routine to avoid having nightmares? Dennis closed himself into Maureen's bedroom closet to wait for the right moment. Maureen wasn't alone. A friend, Gerald Porter, was with her. He came inside, and the two had a few drinks together and chatted in the kitchen, all while Dennis patiently waited in the closet. After the Catherine Bright murder and the struggle with her brother Kevin, Dennis decided that he would rather not attack while a male was in the house. Gerald finally left around 1 a.m. He has waited so long, you would think he would be ready to pounce as soon as she was alone, right? But Maureen puts on her pajamas, brushes her teeth, and crawls into bed. Dennis waits until she's sound asleep. And that is what totally creeps me out. It's why I look under my bed and in my closets before I can relax enough to go to sleep at night. Once Maureen had been sleeping for a while, Dennis creeps out from the closet and flicks on a light in the bathroom, startling her awake. As you can imagine, she is totally shocked and confused to see her neighbor, Dennis Rader, standing at the foot of her bed. He jumps on her and begins strangling her with his bare hands. She was a tiny woman, Barely a hundred pounds. She didn't stand a chance at fighting back. 
Typically, Dennis would strangle his victims, then sit back, masturbate, and leave. Well, this time he mixed things up. He picked up Maureen's body and carried her out to her car. He later stated that he couldn't believe how hard that was to do. He was surprised because she was such a petite woman. But dead weight is perceived as much heavier than a conscious person would feel. Once he had Maureen's body in the trunk of her car, he drove to the church he attended every Sunday. He had keys to the building because he was a trusted leader of the church community. Then he drug her across the ground to the basement doors. He posed her body into different bondage positions and took photographs. He later stated that he took her to the basement, not in the sanctuary, because he has respect for the house of God. Oh, really? You have now murdered eight innocent people. Does it really matter that it's the basement? You still brought a dead body into a church to take disturbing photographs. He couldn't leave her in the church. That would be disrespectful. So he drug her back out to the car and drove. He eventually found a spot he found suitable for dumping her body. He put her down into a ditch and covered her with debris. He left a pair of knotted-up pantyhose, I'm sure to try to link this murder to BTK. As he was dealing with Marine's body, he had set the car keys on the dash. When he returned, the key had slid down the dash and wedged into an area between the windshield and the dash. He wasn't able to reach the key, so in a full panic, he uses a rock to smash a small portion of the windshield so that he could grab the key. It just wouldn't be a dentist project without some major malfunction. He drove her car back to where he was parked, wiped it clean of fingerprints, and abandoned it. By this time, the sun is almost ready to rise. He hurried back to the Boy Scout camp and crawled into bed as if he never left. Following the murder of Maureen Hedge, Dennis did not try to communicate with the police. It was only five months until he was ready to start his next project. 28-year-old mother of two, Vicki Wedgerill. While trolling, he spotted her getting out of her car one day. He knew right then and there she was next. So after a few weeks of stalking Vicki, he made his move. Another daytime murder. Did I mention he was working this day? I guess he thought he could just knock it out between clients. He rang the doorbell wearing a hard hat and holding a bag of tools. When Vicky answered, he told her that he was there to check her telephone line. She let him inside where he walked over to the wall and pretended to mess with the phone. Then he turned around and told her he was going to tie her up. She put up a strong defense and scratched him while he attempted to subdue her. In the end, Dennis was able to get her hands and feet bound. She warned him that her husband, Bill, would be home soon. But to Dennis, that just meant he had to hurry, which was the plan anyways he needed to get back to work. He strangled her using a pair of her pantyhose. Then, he took the family car and drove off. Bill was indeed on his way back home. He recognized Vicky's car driving past him, and he did a double take noticing that it was a man driving. When he got home, their two-year-old son was in the living room. His daughter was still at school. He called out for Vicky with no response. He finally found her in the bedroom, her body laying on the floor behind the bed. He called 911. She was taken by ambulance to the hospital where she was pronounced dead. After Dennis drove off in Vicky's car, he threw any evidence of the crime out the window along the way. He eventually circled back and parked a few blocks away from Vicky and Bill's family home. Then he got out and walked to where his car was parked. I don't really understand why he feels the need to steal vehicles. He took the Otero station wagon, attempted to steal Kevin Bright's truck, and now drove off in Vicky's car. Maybe it's a power trip. Who knows? I am literally shocked at the fact that Dennis has gotten away with his crimes thus far. The community thought Bill was responsible for Vicky's murder. He was never formally charged with anything, but felt the scrutiny from everyone around him for years. In 1988, Dennis was fired from ADT. He apparently wasn't able to meet the quota expected of him. 
I can see why he spent most of his day trolling for victims. Dennis had trouble keeping a job. Over the next four years, he jumped from one random job to the next, but he never stopped trolling. In 1991, he decided he would zone in on a 63-year-old woman named Dolores Davis. She only lived about a mile and a half from the Raiders' home, but she didn't have any direct neighbors. This was part of the reason that he was drawn to her, as well as the fact that she lived alone. This happened during another Boy Scout trip. He left the camp and drove to a Baptist church to park his car and walked to Dolores' home from there. Dennis waited outside until it seemed like she was asleep for the night. He went around back and used a brick to break in through her sliding glass door. Which doesn't sound quiet, but remember, she didn't have any close neighbors and her phone line had been cut. A BTK signature move. Dennis attacked Dolores. He tied her up and strangled her to death. He drug her body outside and placed her in the trunk of her car. And listen carefully because this part is confusing. He drove to a lake area in Park City where he dumped her body and any evidence of the crime. Then he drove back to her house, parked her car, and walked back to his car. Then... He drives his car back to the lake and puts Dolores' body in his trunk and drives her to another location. Yeah, that's a whole lot of back and forth. Maybe he just had second thoughts about the dumping spot and that's why he went back. It honestly doesn't make much sense. After moving her body, he drives back to the Boy Scout camp. He left camp again the following evening to return to Dolores' body. He posed her and took photographs to add to his collection. Honestly, I don't know why he doesn't just take the photos at their homes and leave them there. If it's so difficult to move them, why do it? It's all very strange. Plus, the bodies that he dumped were not connected to BTK initially. Dennis lands a job as a local code enforcer, so he was the asshole out writing tickets for your grass being too tall. He also served as a dog catcher for animal control. But he picked and chose who he was strict with writing citations. Most people found him a pleasure to be around, but one woman in particular found issue with Dennis. She had been living alone, and soon a man moved in with her, and Dennis wrote tons of citations. At first, it was petty little things like the wrong color garden hose, which is crazy that someone can tell you what color garden hose you should own. Then he gave citations for the man who was working on the car in the driveway. Dennis told the woman that if the man left, her citation problems would stop. I assume this was a woman he was fixated on and planned to make a project. She ignored Dennis until one day, Dennis took her dog, who was violating some code, I'm sure, a leash law maybe, and he had it euthanized. After that, the woman moved out of town. She doesn't know how lucky she is to have made that decision. Well, I'm sure she knows now. What a scary realization. Dennis continued breaking and entering homes. He would look through their belongings and learn the layout of their house. But Dolores Davis was the last person he ever killed. He said he really enjoyed his job and it kept him busy, so from 1991 to 2004, Dennis behaved as a normal member of society. In 2004, the online crime library published an article about the unsolved BTK cases. Because it had been so long without any other connected murders, they speculated that the person responsible was either dead or incarcerated for another crime. Not long after, the Wichita Eagle published an article about the Otero murder's 30th anniversary and the fact that the killer had never been caught. Dennis ate it up. It was like lighting that Factor X fire within him. His last two murders weren't even tied to BTK. They were still considered cold cases. On March 17, 2004, Dennis mailed a letter to the Wichita Eagle. Inside the envelope was a photocopy of Vicki Wedgerill's driver's license 
as well as three photocopies of the Polaroids he took of her all tied up after he strangled her. The name listed with the return address was Bill Thomas Kilman, BTK. May 5, 2004, he sent another letter to the local news station, Cake TV. He likes to do it on holidays, apparently, St. Patrick's Day and then Cinco de Mayo. This was a word puzzle that consisted of letters and numbers. No one was able to solve this brilliant man's word puzzle. I guess this was an attempt to mimic the Zodiac Killer. They knew it was from BTK because of his signature logo he left in the upper corner. It's a symbol combining the letters B, T, and K. The B is a pair of boobs. He draws nipples on it and everything. I'll include it in the photos for this week's social media posts. June 9th, a package was left taped to a stop sign on the corner of First and Kansas in Wichita. Inside the package was the description of the Otero murders, details only the killer would know. It included a hand-drawn picture of a girl hanging. Underneath, he wrote, quote, The sexual thrill is my bill, unquote. It also included a full-on book Dennis put together. It was called The BTK Story, Chapter 1, A Serial Killer is Born. Dennis, over time, continues to send letters and packages, 19 in total. One letter stated that he planned to kill again that fall. Another included more fetish flashcards, some with pictures of children with gags and bindings drawn on them. December 14, 2004, a package was discovered in a park. A man opened it to find Nancy Fox's driver's license and a doll. Its head was covered with a plastic bag, and its hands and feet were tied together. Next, a cereal box was found in the bed of a Home Depot worker's truck. When leaving for the day, he grabbed it, assuming it was garbage. Upon closer inspection, the special K box was written on. The upper left-hand corner of the box said the word BOMB, as well as the letters BTK. Inside the box was information he gathered while stalking some of his projects, as well as a typed letter. It stated, Can I communicate with Floppy and not be traced to a computer? Be honest. Under miscellaneous section 494, Rex, it will be okay. Run it for a few days in case I'm out of town, etc. I will try a Floppy for a test run sometime in the near future. February or March. I can't even with this guy. Be honest. Is he serious? The police and FBI want to catch you. Why would they tell you if it's traceable? But they do exactly as he asked. They ran a post in the miscellaneous section of the Wichita Eagles saying, Rex, it will be okay. He chose the name Rex because it rhymes with sex. The man is a complete loser. The Home Depot had surveillance cameras. Although it was too blurry to see his face, they see a man get out of what seems like a black Jeep Cherokee and place the box in the bed of the truck. January 25, 2005, another cereal box was found. A box of Post Toasties. It contained another doll. This one had a rope around its neck and it was hanging from a piece of PVC pipe. Then, since the police said it was okay, Dennis mailed in a floppy disk. Unfortunately for him, the police were lying. They were able to access the original data that was on the disk. They saw the name Dennis and the Christ Lutheran Church in Wichita. And it wasn't hard to look up the church and see that Dennis Rader serves as the church council president. A quick drive-by showed a black Jeep Cherokee in Dennis's driveway. They actually subpoenaed a DNA sample from his daughter's medical records for familial DNA comparison. It was a match. February 25th, 2005, Dennis was driving back home for his lunch break like he did every day when he was suddenly completely surrounded by police sirens. He calmly surrendered. Nearly 30 years after his first murders, BTK was finally caught. He was interrogated and gave a full, detailed confession that took 30 hours. 
Once he discovered that police lied about the floppy disk, he became very upset and any questions following this were with a lawyer present. His wife, Paula, and children, Brian and Carrie, were all completely shocked. They had no idea at all that Dennis was even capable of something like this. Paula filed for divorce immediately, and even though Dennis and Carrie exchanged some letters initially, none of his family members have any type of relationship with him. Throughout this three-part story, you've heard me say Dennis later stated, That's because nearly all the information about these murders came straight from his mouth. During his trial, he nonchalantly described every detail about all 10 murders to the judge. Then, while serving his 10 consecutive life sentences in prison, he exchanged letters with forensic psychologist Catherine Ramsland. She, in turn, wrote a book titled Confession of a Serial Killer, The Untold Story of Dennis Rader, the BTK Killer. A lot of the information I used came from her book. Carrie later wrote a book titled A Serial Killer's Daughter, which I have yet to read but sounds so interesting. I can't imagine what it would be like to know your entire childhood your dad was actually a sadistic murderer. It's next on the Audible list. I'd like to think that sooner or later he would have been caught even if he kept silent. He left semen at just about every crime scene. It's amazing to see the advancements in familial DNA ran across a genealogy database to narrow down suspects, which is how the Golden State Killer was finally caught. I can't wait to cover that one. If you're enjoying Killer Stories, be sure to subscribe so you never miss a new episode. All my episodes are available on YouTube as well. The channel is Killer Stories Podcast. In the show notes, I have listed my link tree, which includes all my social media information as well as my killer merchandise store. I've also listed all the source material I used while researching BTK. I would love if you would leave a review on Apple Podcasts to help boost the show. Keep sending those story suggestions to killerstoriespodcast at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening and sharing with your true crime-loving friends. Until next time, this has been a killer story.